It's not just emergency teams in hospitals that are ready to help you. I know! There are medical crews all over the country on standby 24-7. We're on call with the West Midlands Ambulance Service, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. This is a rapid response car, and it's one of a fleet of vehicles that respond to up to 3,000 emergency calls every day. Time to find out what it's like to be first on the scene of a medical emergency. And a new case is just in. All the information we've got at the moment is that somebody has fainted. So that could be an infection, it could be heart, it could be brain, it could be loads of different things. We don't know their age, we don't know if they're a man or a woman, so we just have to get there quickly as possible, see if we can sort them out. Within minutes, we arrive at our destination. Hello, sir. Hello there. Do you remember what happened this morning? I just went dizzy. I don't remember anything else. 82-year-old Alan was walking home from the shops when two workmen saw him fall over in the street. But we were just uh, working here. What makes sense is just hit the floor. Okay. He's hit his head there. OK. So it's actually quite a cold morning, and he's lucky that these builders saw him fall down, because if he'd knocked his head and been unconscious for a long time, he could have got very cold, and you end up with many problems, a head injury, hypothermia, and whatever led to the fall in the first place. Any heart problems? Your heartbeat's going a little bit slower than it should be, so I'm going to do a quick heart tracing on you. So what Jan's doing now is taking a tracing of his heart, and the reason for that is we don't know why he's fallen, but if it's his heart that's made him fall, before we move him, we need to make sure he's OK. And then I'm going to give you a drug to speed your heart up, OK? Jan's found Alan's heart rate's very slow, and that's why he's collapsed. It's really good that Jan's been able to figure out the problem, and we know that he needs an ambulance and to get to hospital. While Jan administers a drug called atropine to speed up Alan's heart, the ambulance arrives. Alan's slow heart rate is a real concern, and Jan has to administer more medication on the way to the hospital. OK, sweet up. This drug's going in now. So Jan's giving Alan a third dose of atropine to try and get his heart rate up. It's really important that your heart keeps beating strong and it keeps beating quickly enough to get blood around your body and particularly to your brain. What's amazing about Jan is all the things she's done for Alan ECG, blood glucose, she's talking to him the whole time. She's doing while we're moving along at about 30 or 40 miles an hour. Fortunately, we arrive at the hospital quickly because Alan takes another turn for the worse as he's wheeled in. That's a bit hair raising. My biggest concern happened. His heart stopped um, for about a minute, but it's restarted again now and, and he's talking again. Alan actually got a lot more sick as we got to hospital. He's feeling much better now, but it's so good that he's here so quickly, and that's all thanks to Jan being on the scene quickly and a really, really good quick drive here. He's in the right place, and things are looking good for Alan. During a short stay in hospital, Alan had a pacemaker fitted, and he's now happily back at home. Ouch! We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. The West Midlands Ambulance Service is on standby all day, every day, to respond to emergencies. I'm hitching a ride in this rapid response vehicle so you get to see up close what it's like to be first on the scene. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. She can do 20 emergency call-outs in a day. And a new case is just in. We've been called to see a 44-year-old lady, and at the moment, the suspected diagnosis is a stroke. And that means that she's potentially got a blocked blood vessel in her brain. If you act quickly, you can get a much better result than if you wait. So we need to get there fast. Minutes later, we arrive at the address. Inside, Jotty is in shock. She's lost feeling down one side of her body and has no idea why. And suddenly it started going all numb. On the, on the left side of your face, OK. And then I started going down, 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 then my husband pulled me back up. So you just started slumping in the chair, did you? Yeah. I'm going to do a few checks on you. If it is something serious, like if it is a stroke, which obviously we're all concerned about, it can be managed and it can be treated. 
OK? So Jotty has high blood pressure and she's got diabetes. And both of those things make having a stroke a little bit more likely. Can you feel me touching it? I feel that side. Can you not feel this side? Not much there. So what Jan's doing now is assessing how well Jotty's nerves in the brain are working. And all that will tell us whether or not there's a problem in her brain and how quickly she needs to get to hospital. This numbness in this side of the face is not normal. So I would like to get you checked over at the hospital just to make sure that it's not like the start of, of anything like a stroke. So one of the most difficult parts of Jan's job is like, not just making medical decisions, but also dealing with normal, people, trying to persuade people who are frightened of hospitals that maybe it's so a good I idea to like go to in and to explain to people what's wrong. That's what she's sure. doing there. What I'll do is I'll arrange for the ambulance to come, but I'm going to stay with you the whole time, OK? 5157, just amber back up, please. By the time the ambulance crew arrive, Hiya, hello. Jotty's mood has lifted, thanks largely to the expert care she's received from Jan. She even manages a little joke. Why, why do you think you're feeling better? Do you two handsome men like you? <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. Oh, don't make Sorry. their heads any bigger than they already are. Are we going to the opticians? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> So Jodie's now in the ambulance and she's about to go to hospital where she'll get the treatment that she needs. She's laughing and joking, she's much more relaxed. It's a really good result for the emergency services. We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. Today, I'm heading out to show you what it's like to be first at the scene of a medical emergency. Can I drive? No. Can I make the sirens work? No. Can I turn the lights on? No. What can I do? You can carry the bags. Yes, official bag carrier. <laughs> Jan alone can do 10 to 15 emergency call-outs in a day, and the new case is just in. So we've been called to see a lady with what's called postpartum bleeding. She had a baby a week ago and now she's bleeding. Now that can be very dangerous, can actually be life-threatening. Jan and I rush to the scene and get inside as quickly as possible. Hello. We find the patient Jade in a lot of pain. Jan starts treating her while I go to the car to fetch some gas and air. Its medical name is Entenox. It's a mixture of nitrous oxide and oxygen. Sometimes people use it when they're giving birth, but it's a really good way of quickly getting someone who's in severe pain a little bit more comfortable. I'm quickly back in, and Jade is breathing in the soothing gas within seconds. <laughs> Take as much as you need. Slow, big breaths in. At the moment, it's all about bringing Jade's pain levels down to a tolerable level. So she's also given a strong painkiller directly into her vein. All right. See if that helps. Because I want you comfortable before we move you. I'm not moving you off this sofa until you're pain free. All right? Jan is monitoring closely exactly how much pain Jade is in. And what pain score was you initially? If you were a five yeah. man, you were a ten initially. No, I'd say it's about a three. So I can control it. Yeah. That's brilliant. When we arrived, she said our pain was ten out of ten. Now it's more like three out of ten. It so it makes it much easier that, to get to the ambulance, obvious, get yeah. her to hospital, which is where she needs to be. <laughs> Extra help is here. This lady is completely different to when I arrived. And yeah, this is Jade. And Jan's finally happy that Jade's pain is down to a level where she can be comfortably moved into the waiting ambulance. How are you feeling now, Jade? It's still there, but I can cope with it. Thanks, Jan. You've been a diamond. Not a problem. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All the best, then, Jade. Right. Thanks. You take care, darling. Cheers. Right. In a really short space of time, Jan managed to make a massive difference to the amount of pain that Jade was in. She was very anxious when we arrived, and Jan managed to calm her down. Very difficult thing to do with someone in that much pain. By the time she got in the ambulance, she was looking much better. Jade was treated at the hospital and went home the same day. We're going on call with the UK's emergency services, heading into the thick of the action to help save lives. Now it's Chris's turn on the front line. Paramedics who drive these are on call 24-7, always ready for extreme medical emergencies. On call with me today is paramedic Ben White. We're in the rapid response vehicle and a new call has just come in. We've been called to a woman with abdominal pain, that's tummy pain. There are an awful lot of different causes 
for tummy pain. Some of them very, very serious, some of them not very serious at all. So while Ben drives at high speed through traffic, we're also trying to think about what some of those causes might be and what we're going to do while we get there. Thinking ahead like this means that we'll be ready to act quickly when we arrive. James has got his camera, and I've got my camera, so I can get you right to the heart of the action. When we get to the scene, our patient Katie is clearly upset from the pain in her tummy, and her mum is there to support her. Katie has had pain in her abdomen on and off for a while, so Ben begins a thorough examination. No further pressure. No. When did it get a bit, when did the pain get this bad? Midday today. Midday today? Yeah. You can have as much of that as you like, so you can have just nice deep breaths on it. Because Katie's in a lot of pain, Ben is giving her gas and air to make her more comfortable while he continues his examination. Is the pain always in the same place when you get it? Yeah. Does it come on suddenly? It builds up. This device monitors the oxygen in Katie's blood and her heart rate through the pulse in her finger. The pulse readings have been high, which isn't good, but the pain relief is bringing things back to normal now. Kate's pulse rate, as Ben says, has gone from 115... It's about 140 initially. 140? 140 initially right, really. came in. Yeah. It's gone from 140, so very high, as high as if you went for a run, now down to 105 to 110. It's easing it a little, but yeah. you seem a lot calmer now. Although Katie is already feeling more comfortable, Ben calls for an ambulance to take her to hospital for the treatment she needs. So the gas and air has worked and has numbed her pain. It's this amazing transformation. When I arrived, Kate was in tears in the hallway, unable to sit down because if she moved, the pain was really, really intense. And Ben came in, has calmed her down, has given her the gas and air. She's now sitting comfortably. Her pulse has fallen enormously along with her blood pressure, and that's a really good sign. The ambulance team arrived to take Katie to hospital, where they'll be able to run more detailed tests and give her further treatment. So we turned up to find Kate, who's 25 years old, standing in a hallway in tears from pain from a problem. And although Ben can't fix the problem here, she's now on her way to a place where it can be fixed, and he was able to deliver really, really good pain relief. And with our job done, we hit the road again, ready for the next call out. It's thanks to paramedics like Ben who can get to a scene fast that means you'll never be more than a few minutes away from medical care. I'm in awe of a very special group of people and I want you to see exactly what they do. So meet the A-team who fly by the seat of their pants in an awesome helicopter. This is the Midlands Air Ambulance. This airborne medical service has three helicopters always ready for emergency action. With a highly skilled team made up of paramedics, doctors and, of course, pilots, they look after six counties, serve five and a half million people and can get a patient to hospital in just 15 minutes. Always on standby, they're ready for every call. Flying high on today's special assignment are Dr John Bingham and paramedic Steph Cormack. When the phone rings, they have to be ready to go within seconds. It's five o'clock and a call's just come in. The team write information down on special pads on their knees for speed and to keep their hands free. With the helicopter fueled and ready to go, it's not long before they're airborne. Helicopters are small, so why wait at base while the team are called to the scene of an accident where a car is on fire? Got uh, reports of an adult who's been involved in some form of a car fire. The car fire out the window now. It was like a huge bonfire. It was like lots and lots of smoke. When you're landing, you see this car on fire. What kind of things are going through your head? The first thing is always the safety. You know, where can we land where we can get to the patients as quickly as possible, but we're far enough away or in a place where we're not going to be involved with the smoke, with the fire, in the, in the way of the fire crew. The fire's obviously still going, so we're going to be staying a safe distance back. As the fire service tackled the burning car, Dr John assessed the driver didn't have any burns injuries. I mean, that's one thing that could cause a huge problem. Um, and fortunately, he could tell us that he's not been burned. There's nothing from the flames. From the breathing in the smoke point of view, the issues that we often see is that people have or develop respiratory distress. They have difficulty breathing. So your throat seal's a bit sore, does it? No, it's not sore, just... <clears throat> Tickly. 
a bit of a cough, a bit of a cough, very yeah, yeah. But your breathing feels okay, yeah, yeah. no other problems with dizziness, no pain, anything else no. at all. Let's have a quick listen to his chest anyway. It's okay, first of all. As well as being able to get to a scene quickly, an air ambulance crew has another huge benefit. With a doctor on board, casualties can be assessed and often treated on site. So we're just going to get a full set of observations just to make sure that he's breathing normally, his oxygen levels are good, blood pressure's OK. And if following that, if he's still good, then actually there's no reason why he can't be discharged from scene. It was a large and dangerous fire, but now the flames are under control. What about at the end? Is there anything left of the car now? Or? It's basically just a shell. The tyres have melted off, it's stuck to the road, there's nothing inside. Even the engine, it doesn't even look like an engine, it's just bits of wires hanging out. It was a lucky escape. And with the patient discharged from the scene, the team were able to head back to the helicopter. Well, we need to get things packed up relatively quickly and just get moved on and uh, on to the next job. You never know what the next call is going to be. It's just the nature of the job. With such fast helicopters and great expertise on board, the air ambulance are a vital addition to our emergency services. They're definitely the team I'd want to help me. It's not only emergency departments in hospitals that deal with the unexpected. That's right, Chris. All over the UK, there are expert teams ready for action. We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. This is a rapid response car. It's one of a fleet of vehicles that respond to up to 3,000 emergencies a day here in the West Midlands. Time to find out what it's like to be first at the scene of a medical emergency. If you have an accident, this fast medical service is ready to help 24 hours a day. So I've got my camera. Eric's in the back with his camera. We're going to get you as close to the action as we can. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. She can do 20 emergency call-outs in a day. And a new case is just in. So at the moment, all we know is that three children have been involved in a road traffic accident, in a car crash, and that they've been taken home, but there's still some ongoing problem. We don't, we don't know any more than that yet. We need to get there and have a look. And just minutes later, we're at the house. Inside, there are two children, Annie and Ryan, waiting to be checked over. When did you notice that you had pain in your head? Um, I banged my head and started hurting when I was in my dad's car on the way back. So you didn't notice it immediately? No. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it, that you hit your head and you don't, you don't notice it, you're so surprised, and then later on it starts to hurt. After an accident, it's important to get checked over... Try and pull me towards you. ..either by a medic, a doctor or at your local A&E, as some injuries take time to appear. So you've got a little bit of a headache? Yeah. And has that headache got any worse or has it stayed the same? Still the same. Still stayed the same. So what Jan's doing now is making sure that Annie and Ryan haven't got any other injuries which are a bit harder to find. Push and pull down. Brilliant. Gosh, you're strong, aren't you? Do you go to the gym? So she's checking their strength to make sure that oh, their nerves are right, she's checking their hands and their arms. Feel me touching you? Feel me touching you? And she's checking the nerves coming out of their brain, she's checking eyes and mouth, things like that. But so far, everything looks really good. But it's really nice that Jan's able to get here quickly, assess them at home, and hopefully spare them a trip to hospital and any more investigations. Well, that looks absolutely fine, so that's good. Did you have any pain in your neck or anything like that? It ached a little bit, but it was, okay. it was fine. And are you feeling all right now? Mm. OK, good. They could, over the next couple of days, get some stiffness in their neck, which is called whiplash, um, which happens after an accident. Right, this is paracetamol, OK? And as long as there's no worsening headaches and there's no confusion and no vomiting, then they should be fine. So Jan's checked out Ryan and Annie, and they're both really well, and they're sitting on the sofa comfortably. And a lot of that is because they were both wearing their seatbelts. It's a really good result. And if you ever have a medical emergency, there are hundreds of similar crews on standby around the UK, ready to help. If you have a medical emergency, there are teams of paramedics all over the country on standby, ready to spring into action. We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. 
This is a rapid response vehicle. It's on standby 24-7 to respond to whatever emergency calls come in. Today, I'm going along for the ride and you're coming with me. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. She can do 20 call-outs in a day. And a new case is just in. We've just been called to an emergency and we know it's a man. They've fallen in the garden and they've got blurred vision. Minutes later, we arrive at the scene. And just as we get there, oh, oh. the man, Peter, falls again. Right. Darling, you need to keep still for me. <laughs> well, at least you're laughing. God, you're just going to be the fight of my life. Oh. It's still with this. <laughs> Joking aside, Jan quickly gets him sorted and makes an immediate assessment of his possible injuries. Yeah. Squeeze me. Not it. too hard. I need my fingers afterwards. <laughs> he can do some things well, but there's a problem. I can see about half of you. The rest has disappeared. Peter's not seeing properly. The thing that we've got at the minute is his eyes aren't moving together, they're moving separately, so we need to find yeah. out why that's going on. OK. Right, look at me. I shine a little light into your eyes. So what Jan's just done is had a look at how the nerves in his head and face are working. We want to see if he's had a stroke, if he's had a blockage in a blood vessel to his brain, and that may have damaged a little bit of his brain, which controls his eyes. A stroke is worrying because it's potentially life-threatening, but then things change again. Yeah. Yeah. I can see. Follow your pen again. Keep your eye nice and still. Keep your head still. Follow the pen. Peter's symptoms seem to be improving. And that shed looks like it's in the right position yeah. again. His eyes are together now. Okay. Initially, they were yeah. Yeah. separate. They were miles out. <laughs> it's taken about half an hour from when his symptoms started to, to going away again. It's just about completely gone. And that does suggest that it's likely to be what we call a mini-stroke. And what's good about a mini-stroke is they do get better, but they do suggest you're at higher risk of having a bigger stroke. And a bigger stroke could be more serious. The danger of that happening again is there at the minute, so we'll get him checked over. So it's an ambulance for Peter. I'm not sure he's... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Right, steady, steady, sure he's steady. He's still very unsteady, but it's vitally important that potential stroke victims are checked over as soon as possible. Good luck, Peter. So what Jan's able to do really well there is examine Peter, figure out where he needs to go to get the best treatment and get him there quickly. It's what the emergency services do really well. With hundreds of rapid response crews in the UK, if you have an accident, an emergency service like this won't be far away. In the UK, there are hundreds of rapid response medical teams on standby. And they have to get to the scene of an emergency in minutes. Minutes? <laughs> We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. Today, I'm hitching a ride in one of the West Midlands Ambulance Service's rapid response vehicles, and paramedic Jan Van is having me along. Jan, where's the vehicle? How does she do that? And a new case is just in. We've just got a call about a five-year-old girl not eating or drinking, vomiting, high temperature, rash on cheek. So, Jan, obviously, vomiting with a rash, one of the things we've got to think about is meningitis. Meningitis, yeah. If it is meningitis, that could be quite serious. So, treatment has to start straight away. Within minutes, we arrive at the scene. I've got my camera and Eric's got his, so you won't miss any of the action. Hello. Hello. What's your name? Rima. That's pretty. What's been happening, Mum? She's got a really high temperature. Yeah. Every time she's getting the carport, it's soothing, but it's going back up again. OK. Jan checks for meningitis, which often shows itself as a rash, and if not treated, this can be serious. Fantastic. Luckily, there's no rash, but she does have a high temperature. Rima's temperature is 39.9 degrees. Now, normal body temperature should be just below 37. So it may not sound like much, but actually, if you're at 39.9 degrees centigrade, that can be quite dangerous just by itself. Is she weeing, Mum? Yes, she's a wee. But when did she do a wee? About half an hour ago, two, three hours ago. OK. And when you go for a wee, does it hurt? 
No. So although Reem has been vomiting, she hasn't been drinking very much, she is still making wee. And that shows that her kidneys are working, that she actually has enough fluid in her body. So that's a really good sign. Looking at all her observations, they're all normal, but she's got quite high temperature. So the biggest problem at the moment is she's got some sort of viral infection. The good news is Rima won't need a trip to hospital. Yeah, I'm a paramedic on scene with a little poorly child. But Jan makes an appointment for her to see her GP. What do you think of Jan? And it's a thumbs up from Rima. <laughs> I mean, I was quite worried about Rima. When we took her temperature and it was 39.9, that is a seriously high temperature. But luckily, Jan's able to be really reassuring, say it's definitely not meningitis. And after a visit to her GP, Rima was treated for a viral infection and soon recovered. We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. This is a rapid response vehicle, and it's on standby 24-7 to respond to whatever emergency calls coming in. Today, I'm going along for the ride, and guess what? You're coming with me. Jan can take 10 to 15 emergency call-outs in a day. And a new case is just in. So we've had a 999 call to a 53-year-old lady who's injured her ankle. So it could be anything from a simple sprain to blood loss, severe pain, and maybe some other cause for the fall that could be life-threatening as well. So we've got to get there quickly, find out what's going on. The call has taken us right into the centre of town. Hello. Hello. Is it Linda? It is. Well, what's happened? What? Tripped over the man I Oh, on. just the edge of that raised platform yeah. there. Okay. So was you knocked unconscious at all? No. Have you hit your head or the back of your neck or your back at all? No. What have you injured? My knee and my ankle. OK. Really Are you able to bend your knee at all? I do, but my ankle hurts. Your ankle hurts when you bend it? Okay. Yeah. Press down on my hand. Push down as hard as you can. Where does that hurt when you push down? From the ankle. On the outside? Yeah. Linda's ankle is clearly causing her a lot of pain. So it may just look like Jan's feeling her ankle, but in fact, she's feeling in very particular places. There's a set of rules called the Ottawa Ankle Rules, and they help you decide whether they're likely to have broken a bone. So Jan's trying to figure out which bits are tender. That'll tell us whether she needs to go to hospital. Yeah, I'm going to need Emma back up for this patient. She's unable to wait there, um, needs an X-ray. Using the Ottawa rules, Jan has decided that the ankle is probably broken and Linda does need an ambulance. The moment she's quite uncomfortable, we're managing to keep her warm, but she can't walk on that leg. So we need to get her to hospital and get her an X-ray. She can be treated from there. It's important to keep it still so that if she's got any bones that are broken, if the edges rub together, it can create a lot of pain and it can create some bleeding, which will make the ankle worse as well. You're doing it, that's it. Well done, darling. Are you able to twist around a little bit? There you go. It's really good that Jan was able to assess her really quickly, get her an ambulance and get her to hospital where she needs to be. And once there, the doctors discovered Linda's ankle was broken and it was soon fixed. <laughs> 